Welcome back to Chapter 3, now on Section 2, Foundations of Modern Cell Theory. Learning Objectives Explain the key points of cell theory and the individual contributions of Hooke, Schleiden, Swan, Remack, and Virchow. Explain the key points of endosymbiotic theory and cite the evidence that supports this concept. Explain the contributions of Semmelweis, Snow, Pasteur, Lister, and Koch to the development of germ theory. While some scientists were arguing over the theory of spontaneous generation, other scientists were making discoveries leading to a better understanding of what we now call the cell theory. Modern cell theory has two basic tenets. All cells only come from other cells, the principle of biogenesis. Cells are the fundamental units of organisms. Today, these tenets are fundamental to our understanding of life on Earth. However, modern cell theory grew out of the collective work of many scientists. The Origin of Cell Theory The English scientist Robert Hooke first used the term cells in 1665 to describe the small chambers within cork that he observed under a microscope of his own design. To Hooke, thin sections of cork resembled honeycomb, or small boxes or bladders of air. He noted that each cavern, bubble, or cell was distinct from the others. At the time, Hooke was not aware that the cork cells were long dead and therefore lacked the internal structures found within living cells. Despite Hooke's early description of cells, their significance as the fundamental unit of life was not yet recognized. Nearly 200 years later, in 1838, Matthias Schleiden, who lived from 1804 to 1881, a German botanist who made extensive microscopic observations of plant tissues described them as being composed of cells. Visualizing plant cells was relatively easy because plant cells are clearly separated by their thick cell walls. Schleiden believed that cells formed through crystallization rather than cell division. Theodore Schwann, who lived from 1810 to 1882, a noted German physiologist made similar microscopic observations of animal tissue. In 1839, after a conversation with Schleiden, Schwann realized that similarities existed between plant and animal tissues. This laid the foundation for the idea that cells are the fundamental components of plants and animals. In the 1850s, two Polish scientists living in Germany pushed this idea further culminating in what we recognize today as the modern cell theory. In 1852, Robert Remack, lived from 1815 to 1865, a prominent neurologist and embryologist published convincing evidence that cells are derived from other cells as a result of cell division. However, this idea was questioned by many in the scientific community. Three years later, Rudolf Virchow, 1821 to 1902, a well-respected pathologist published an editorial essay entitled Cellular Pathology, which popularized the concept of cell theory using the Latin phrase omnis cellula a cellula, all cells arise from cells, which is essentially the second tenet of modern cell theory. Given the similarity of Virchow's work to Remax, there is some controversy as to which scientists should receive credit for articulating cell theory. See the following Eye on Ethics feature for more about this controversy. Eye on Ethics, brought to us by Sigma Xi, the Scientific Research Society. Science and Plagiarism Rudolf Virchow, a prominent Polish-born German scientist, is often remembered as the father of pathology. Well known for innovative approaches, he was one of the first to determine the causes of various diseases by examining their effects on tissues and organs. He was also among the first to use animals in his research and, as a result of his work, he was the first to name numerous diseases and created many other medical terms. Over the course of his career, he published more than 2,000 papers and headed various important medical facilities, including the Charité Universistats Medizin Berlin, a prominent Berlin hospital and medical school. But he is perhaps best remembered for his 1855 editorial essay entitled Cellular Pathology, 
published an archive for pathologics, anatomy, und physiology, a journal that Vera Chow himself co-founded and still exists today. Despite his significant scientific legacy, there was some controversy regarding this essay in which Vera Chow proposed the central tenet of modern cell theory, that all cells arise from other cells. Robert Remack, a former colleague who worked in the same laboratory as Vera Chow at the University of Berlin, had published the same idea three years before. Though it appears Vera Chow was familiar with Remack's work, he neglected to credit Remack's ideas in his essay. When Remack wrote a letter to Vera Chow pointing out similarities between Vera Chow's ideas and his own, Vera Chow was dismissive. In 1858, in the preface to one of his books, Virchow wrote that his 1855 publication was just an editorial piece, not a scientific paper, and thus there was no need to cite Remax's work. By today's standards, Virchow's editorial piece would certainly be considered an act of plagiarism, since he presented Remax's idea as his own. However, in the 19th century, standards for academic integrity were much less clear. Virchow's strong reputation coupled with the fact that Remack was a Jew in a somewhat anti-Semitic political climate, shielded him from any significant repercussions. Today, the process of peer review and the ease of access to the scientific literature help discourage plagiarism, although scientists are still motivated to publish original ideas that advance scientific knowledge, those who would consider plagiarizing are well aware of the serious consequences. In academia, plagiarism represents the theft of both individual thought and research, an offense that can destroy reputations and end careers. Endosymbiotic Theory As scientists were making progress towards understanding the role of cells in plant and animal tissues, others were examining the structures within the cells themselves. In 1831, Scottish botanist Robert Brown 1773 to 1858, was the first to describe observations of nuclei, which he observed in plant cells. Then, in the early 1880s, a German botanist, Andreas Schimper, 1856 to 1901, was the first to describe the chloroplasts of plant cells, identifying their role in starch formation during photosynthesis and noting that they divided independent of the nucleus. Based upon the chloroplast's ability to reproduce independently, Russian botanist Konstantin Marischkowski, 1855-1921, suggested in 1905 that chloroplasts may have originated from ancestral photosynthetic bacteria living symbiotically inside a eukaryotic cell. He proposed a similar origin for the nucleus of plant cells. This was the first articulation of the endosymbiotic hypothesis and would explain how eukaryotic cells evolved from ancestral bacteria. Marischkowski's endosymbiotic hypothesis was furthered by American anatomist Ivan Wallen, 1883 to 1969, who began to experimentally examine the similarities between mitochondria, chloroplasts, and bacteria. In other words, to put the endosymbiotic hypothesis to the test using objective investigation. Wallen published a series of papers in the 1920s supporting the endosymbiotic hypothesis, including a 1926 publication co-authored with Marinchkowski. Wallen claimed he could culture mitochondria outside of their eukaryotic host cells. Many scientists dismissed his cultures of mitochondria as resulting from bacterial contamination. Modern genome sequencing work supports the dissenting scientists by showing that much of the genome of mitochondria has been transferred to the host cell's nucleus, preventing the mitochondria from being able to live on their own. Wallen's ideas regarding the endosymbiotic hypothesis were largely ignored for the next 50 years because scientists were unaware that these organelles contained their own DNA. However, with the discovery of mitochondrial and chloroplast DNA in the 1960s, the endosymbiotic hypothesis was resurrected. Lynn Margulis, 1938 to 2011, an American geneticist, published her ideas regarding the endosymbiotic hypothesis of the origins of mitochondria and chloroplasts in 1967. In the decade leading up to her publication, advances in microscopy had allowed scientists to differentiate prokaryotic cells from eukaryotic cells. 
In her publication, Margulis reviewed the literature and argued that the eukaryotic organelles such as mitochondria and chloroplasts are of prokaryotic origin. She presented a growing body of microscopic genetic molecular biology, fossil, and geological data to support her claims. Again, this hypothesis was not initially popular, but mounting genetic evidence due to the advent of DNA sequencing supported the endosymbiotic theory, which is now defined as the theory that mitochondria and chloroplasts arose as a result of prokaryotic cells establishing a symbiotic relationship with a eukaryotic host. With Margulis Initial endosymbiotic theory gaining wide acceptance, she expanded on the theory in her 1981 book, Symbiosis in Cell Evolution. In it, she explains how endosymbiosis is a major driving factor in the evolution of organisms. More recent genetic sequencing and phylogenetic analysis shows that mitochondrial DNA and chloroplast DNA are highly related to their bacterial counterparts, both in DNA sequence and chromosome structure. However, mitochondrial DNA and chloroplast DNA are reduced compared with nuclear DNA because many of the genes have moved from the organelles into the host cell's nucleus. Additionally, mitochondrial and chloroplast ribosomes are structurally similar to bacterial ribosomes rather than to the eukaryotic ribosomes of their hosts. Last, the binary fission of these organelles strongly resembles the binary fission of bacteria as compared with mitosis performed by eukaryotic cells. Since Margulis' original proposal, scientists have observed several examples of bacterial endosymbionts in modern-day eukaryotic cells. Examples include the endosymbiotic bacteria found within the guts of certain insects, such as cockroaches, and of photosynthetic bacteria-like organelles found in protists. The germ theory of disease. Prior to the discovery of microbes during the 17th century, other theories circulated about the origins of disease. For example, the ancient Greeks proposed the miasma theory, which held that disease originated from particles emanating from decomposing matter, such as that in sewage or cesspits, such particles infected humans in close proximity to the rotting material. Diseases included the Black Death, which ravaged Europe's population during the Middle Ages, or thought to have originated this way. In 1546, Italian physician Girolamo Fracastoro proposed in his essay De Contagione et Contagiosis Morbus that seed-like spores may be transferred between individuals through direct contact, exposure to contaminated clothing, or through the air. We now recognize Fracastoro as an early proponent of the germ theory of disease, which states that diseases may result from microbial infection. However, in the 16th century, Fracastoro's ideas were not widely accepted and would be largely forgotten until the 19th century. In 1847, Hungarian obstetrician Ignaz Semmelweis observed that mothers who gave birth in hospital wards staffed by physicians and medical students were more likely to suffer and die from puerperal fever after a childbirth, 10 to 20% mortality rate, than were mothers in wards staffed by midwives, 1% mortality rate. Simmelweis observed medical students performing autopsies and then subsequently carrying out vaginal examinations on living patients without washing their hands in between. He suspected that students carried disease from the autopsies to the patients they examined. His suspicions were supported by the untimely death of a friend, a physician who contracted a fatal wound infection after a post-mortem examination of a woman who had died of puerperal infection. The dead physician's wound had been caused by a scalpel used during the examination, and his subsequent illness and death closely paralleled that of the dead patient. Although Simmelweis did not know the true cause of puerperal fever, I mean, the true cause could be any number of pathogens, he proposed that physicians were somehow transferring the causative agent to their patients. He suggested that the number of puerperal fever cases could be reduced if physicians and medical students simply washed their hands 
with chlorinated lime water before and after examining every patient. When this practice was implemented, the maternal mortality rate in mothers cared for by physicians dropped to the same 1% mortality rate observed among mothers cared for by midwives. This demonstrated that hand washing was a very effective method for preventing disease transmission. Despite this great success, many discounted Semmelweis's work at the time, and physicians were slow to adopt the simple procedure of hand washing to prevent infections in their patients because it contradicted established norms for that time period. And the rest of his story was just more sad. He essentially got laughed out of Vienna and wound up in an asylum where he later died. Around the same time Simmelweis was promoting hand washing in 1848, British physician John Snow conducted studies to track the source of cholera outbreaks in London. By tracing the outbreaks to two specific water sources, both of which were contaminated by sewage, Snow ultimately demonstrated that cholera bacteria were transmitted via drinking water. Snow's work is influential in that it represents the first known epidemiological study, and it resulted in the first known public health response to an epidemic. The work of both Semmelweis and Snow clearly refuted the prevailing miasma theory of the day, showing that disease is not only transmitted through the air, but also through contaminated items. Although the work of Simmelweis and Snow successfully showed the role of sanitation in preventing infectious disease, the cause of disease was not fully understood. The subsequent work of Louis Pasteur, Robert Koch, and Joseph Lister would further substantiate the germ theory of disease. While studying the causes of beer and wine spoilage in 1856, Pasteur discovered properties of fermentation by microorganisms. He demonstrated with his swan neck flask experiments that airborne microbes, not spontaneous generation, were the cause of food spoilage. And he suggested that if microbes were responsible for food spoilage and fermentation, they could also be responsible for causing infection. This was the foundation for the germ theory of disease. Meanwhile, British surgeon Joseph Lister was trying to determine the cause of post-surgical infections. Many physicians did not give credence to the idea that microbes on their hands, on their clothes, or in the air could infect patients' surgical wounds, despite the fact that 50% of surgical patients, on average, were dying of post-surgical infections. Lister, however, was familiar with the work of Semmelweis and Pasteur, therefore he insisted on hand washing and extreme cleanliness during surgery. In 1867, to further decrease the incidence of post-surgical wound infections, Lister began using carbolic acid phenol, spray disinfectant antiseptic during surgery. His extremely successful efforts to reduce post-surgical infections caused his technique to become a standard medical practice. A few years later, Robert Koch proposed a series of postulates, Koch's postulates, based on the idea that the cause of a specific disease could be attributed to a specific microbe. Using these postulates, Koch and his colleagues were able to definitively identify the causative pathogens of specific diseases, including anthrax, tuberculosis, and cholera. Koch's one microbe, one disease concept was the culmination of the 19th century's paradigm shift away from the miasma theory and toward the germ theory of disease. Koch's postulates are discussed more thoroughly in How Pathogens Cause Disease. Clinical Focus, Part 2. After suffering a fever, congestion, cough, and increasing aches and pains for several days, Barbara suspects that she has a case of the flu. She decides to visit the health center at her university. The PA tells Barbara that her symptoms could be due to a range of diseases such as influenza, bronchitis, pneumonia, or tuberculosis. During her physical examination, the PA notes that Barbara's heart rate is slightly elevated. Using a pulse oximeter, a small device that clips on her finger, he finds that Barbara has hypoxemia, a lower than normal level of oxygen in the blood. 
Using a stethoscope, the PA listens for abnormal sounds made by Barbara's heart, lungs, and digestive system. As Barbara breathes, the PA hears a crackling sound and notes a slight shortness of breath. He collects a sputum sample, noting the greenish color of the mucus, and orders a chest radiograph, which shows a shadow in the left lung. All of these signs are suggestive of pneumonia, a condition in which the lung fills with mucus. What kind of infectious agents are known to cause pneumonia? Here is a timeline of the discovery of the germ theory of disease. Starting with the incorrect miasma theory through Fakastoro's unproven germ theory through Hook, Van Leeuwenhoek, Semmelweis, Snow, Pasteur, Lister, and Koch. Okay, that ends section two. Join me next time for section three, unique characteristics of prokaryotic cells. Till then.